There is a war going on in Israel. I'm sure you've heard of it. Hamas has attacked Israel in the last five days. 1,200 Israelis have been killed. Well over that number have been killed on the Hamas side in retaliation. Over 2,700 Israelis have been injured. Hundreds have been taken hostage and captive. Many have been murdered mercilessly, savagely, beheaded, burned alive raped and plundered, brutalized, fires and swords and every kind of imaginable calamity has been taking place in southern Israel. And now tonight, Hezbollah is attacking Israel on the north. Iranian drones are coming in from the north from Hezbollah and the Jezreel Valley is under siege. The T Tiberias region, Bet Shin and so many other areas are under attack from Iranian drones. Guys, this war is going to get a lot bigger. Russia wants to get involved. Turkey is involved. Iranians are involved. You wouldn't believe it, but Rome's involved. And it's all against Israel and ultimately against the United States of America. And it is a biblical end game we're going to talk about. We've got two big wars in Bible prophecy that are about to take place. The Sixth Trumpet War and the Battle of Armageddon. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight because we've got so much going on. I want you to know and understand that the Bible has the last say in all these matters. One of the biggest reasons why I'm a Christian today, one of the reasons for the last 40 years I've been as uh, faithful to this as I could possibly be because I came to realize after three years of atheism, you can't deny God. The prophecies of this Bible are, are absolutely irrefutable. The scripture says the testimony of Jesus Christ, that is to say the evidence of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. We've got so much going on in the world today that's being fulfilled according to the ancient prophecies from thousands of years ago. It's hard for anybody to reconcile these things apart from the reality there is a living God who controls the heavens and the earth. He, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And he speaks those things that are not as though they be. And he knows the end from the beginning. And I'm talking about a God of the prophecies of this Bible is telling us where we're headed and how we're going to get there. And we're going to talk about that tonight. The biblical end game. We've got two big wars brewing. The great and final battle of Armageddon has to be preceded by the sixth trumpet war, which the Bible says is going to be a start on the river Euphrates up in Syria. And all the great spirits of this world are going to be there, the white horse of Catholicism, the red horse of communism, the green horse of Islam, and the black horse of capitalism. And so we're going to see how this situation in Israel right now is already leading in that direction. We're going to, we're going to take note tonight of, of uh, basically four powers. One is uh, Russia and Vladimir Putin. Another is Turkey and President Reese Septayip Erdogan, another is King Charles of Britain, and of course Israel and Rome, the Vatican, the Pope of the Catholic Church. So stay with me for this program, will you? I'm going to go to this little Twitter feed. Here's a guy on Twitter I saw today, and I, I can't speak for his credentials, but it is a useful list of events that have taken place in the last 24 hours or so. And so I'm going to run through these things right quickly to update you on what has actually been going on in the uh, state of Israel. First of all, he said at least 1,000 Israelis and 830 Palestinians have been killed. Now, those numbers are updated, and they're probably twice that many by now. Number two, the prosecutor for the International Criminal Court said the court's mandate applies to the current conflict as it has known going investigation for alleged war crimes committed since the 13th of June 2014. So the International Criminal Court is out to get Israel, not the Palestinians. But anybody knows these people are dark and brutal and merciless and savage. Number three, a senior Hamas official denied reports that Iran was involved in the planning of the Palestinian attack on Israel. That is laughable to think that Iran has nothing to do with this. Number four, a Palestinian Liberation Organization official said that Israel refused a request to bring food and uh, medical supplies into Gaza. I'm sure Israel's answer to that is, you treat us like savages, you get treated like savage. Number five, President Biden of the United States gave a public address on the Israel-Palestinian war. He said at least 14 Americans have been killed so far and that the United States is surging increased military assistance to Israel. He made no mention of Israel's large-scale bombardment of Gaza or its decision to impose a full siege. 
Number six, thousands of people gathered in Amman, Jordan to protest in solidarity with Gaza. So what we're seeing around the world is Muslims are cheering this and celebrating Hamas's uh, brutal attack on Israel. Number seven, the EU foreign policy chief said that while Israel has the right to defend itself, some of these decisions it has made are against international law. And he also said that stopping aid to Palestinians would be a mistake. Number eight, Britain's Home Secretary Braverman sent a letter advising that the police in Britain should consider whether to view acts like waving Palestinian flags or chanting from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free as a crime. Or are they going to get into free speech here and ban that? Number nine, 177,000 people in Gaza are now sheltering in United Nations schools. Number 10, Turkish Airlines suspended flights to Israel till further notice, according to several Turkish media reports. Number 11, the number of French citizens killed in the attacks in Israel rose to at least eight. Number 12, Sweden is temporarily halting all development aid to Palestine. Number 13, this is significant. Turkey's President Erdogan said, Israel has no right to cut off water to Gaza. And you're going to see, hopefully, before I get through here tonight, that Erdogan is no real friend of Israel. He speaks duplicitously, but in the end, he's a Muslim. He descends from the Muslim Brotherhood. He's a Sunni Muslim, and he is very much in favor of the Palestinians. He supports Hamas. He supports Hezbollah. So when he makes these statements, you have to understand there's far more behind these statements than what meets the eyes. Number 14, the Scottish First Minister called on the United Kingdom's government to push for a corridor to evacuate civilians from Gaza. He also revealed that his parents-in-law are trapped in Gaza amid four consecutive days of Israeli airstrikes. You know, Israel has devastated all the Hamas military uh, points in Gaza already. Number 15, renewed gunfights between Israeli troops and Palestinian fighters were reported in Sederot, according to Israeli media. Number 16, Israel's military announced that its army was firing artillery at rocket launch sites in Lebanon. Number 17, heavy rockets hit Ashkelon, with casualties reported. Number 18, rockets were fired simultaneously from Lebanon and Gaza towards Israel. So we've got a multiple front war going on. Israel is fighting a front from Syria, from Lebanon, and from the Gaza Strip right now. Sirens are blaring in southern and northern Israel. Number 19, two members of Hamas political bureau, including an economy minister of the Gaza-based administration, were killed in Israeli airstrikes. Number 20, an Israeli military general doubled down on his defense minister's labeling of Palestinians as human animals, and he vowed to give them hell. Number 21, Egyptian fuel trucks and relief materials were filmed leaving the vicinity of of the Rafah crossing between Gaza and Egypt, so Egypt supporting Hamas. 22, a military source at the Jordanian military denied reports that the U.S. Army used a base in Jordan to transport supplies to Israel, according to the Jordanian me media. Number 23, sirens were activated in Tel Aviv and across Israel, the Ar Israeli army said. Now, this brings into focus the fact that Tel Aviv has been one of the real targets of this. Tel Aviv has had bombs going off all in the south of Tel Aviv, some of them getting very, very close to Tel Aviv, so much so that the, Israeli, uh, the Ben Gurion Airport has been shut down for the most part. United Airlines and American Airlines have canceled all their flights into Tel Aviv. Delta Airlines said they're canceling for a month. Some of the other airlines are shutting down. The only airline that's really operating right now is El Al, which is the Jewish uh, airline and they're bringing in uh, Jews from all over the world who've been activated to go to war. So they're bringing these people in as quickly as they can. Number 24, and this is significant, President Putin of Russia said the sharp escalation of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is a vivid example of the U.S.'s policy failure in the Middle East. This is a slam against Joe Biden and the Democrats. He's saying this basically would not have happened and I'm going to add between the lines, if Donald Trump had been there, it certainly wouldn't have happened. Number 25, the spokesman of Hamas, Izadim al-Qassam Brigades, 
said that Ashkelon residents should leave the coastal Israeli city before 5 p.m. local time because they apparently intend to attack Ashkelon. Number 26, an Israeli army spokesman said that accuracy is not their primary concern when it comes to attacking the Gaza Strip. Number 27, Israel said it will bomb trucks carrying supplies from Egypt to Gaza, according to Israel's Channel 12. Number 28, the Palestinian Health Ministry in Gaza said it's facing difficulties updating the death toll regularly because of disruptions in Internet and communications networks. 29, Prime Minister Netanyahu's Likud party released a statement saying that all coalition partners in the government now favors the creation of an emergency national unity government. Number 30, a second Israeli airstrike hit the Egypt-Gaza Rafah crossing, according to Egyptian media. Israeli warplanes bombed the Rafah border crossing between Egypt and Gaza, and the Palestinian Ministry of Interior said. Number 32, Palestinian journalists held a funeral for fellow reporters killed in intense Israeli shelling of the Gaza. So I want to, I want to bring this to some kind of a summary here and tell you in the, in the light of Bible prophecies what I think are the most significant talking points of what's going on in the Middle East right now. Number one, the hostilities between Israel and Hamas are only the tip of the iceberg. Iran is the elephant in the room. Hamas and Hezbollah are proxies for Iran and the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. They're all hostile. They're all terrorists. They all want to wipe Israel off the map. Third, the United States greatly enabled this conflict by supporting Iran, by not supporting uh, Israel in this matter. They've allowed the monies to be released that had been under their sanctioning, and now billions and billions of dollars have gone to Iran, and many of those monies are, are certainly going into Hamas and into Hezbollah. Saudi Arabia is also siding with the Palestinians. That effectively has blown up this peace process between Israel and Saudi Arabia for the time being. And number five, Turkey and Russia are threatening to step in. Both of these parties are friendly with Iran. I got to tell you guys, it's not good news to bring Russia and Turkey and Iran in on this situation as the power brokers. Number six, the two-state solution is really the bait of this whole conflict. But it's not just the two-state solution they want because we know when they get two states, they want to go further and they want to annihilate Israel. That's the ultimate goal. And I have to tell you, based on Bible prophecies that I know, the New World Order is the end game. The Vatican-engineered Chrislam that we're seeing uh, between the Catholic Church and Islam is going to end up opposing Jews and true Christians. And according to the prophecies of the Bible, the Great Tribulation is going to spawn this sixth trumpet war in the Middle East right there on the Euphrates River. And we're going to see Islam and Russia, Turkey, Iran, and all these nations, including the United States, are going to be there at the sixth trumpet war. One third of mankind is going to die, and then that's going to ultimately end up in the Middle East, down and around Jerusalem at the great and final battle of Armageddon. When they come to destroy Israel and wipe her off the map, Jesus Christ is going to come back. And that's why I give you this uh, introductory statement here. Russia, according to the prophecies of Ezekiel 38, is Gog and Magog. Iran is Persia of Ezekiel 38. Turkey is Gomer to Garma of Ezekiel 38. And Rome is Mystery Babylon of Revelation 17 and 18. So the biblical end game is that we're going to see these powers uh, rise, and we're going to see Israel and the West under siege. And when you see the doctrine of the four horsemen, you see it in uh, Zechariah chapter 6, you see it in Revelation chapter 6, and then the sixth trumpet war in Revelation chapter 9, all three chapters uh, tell us that these four spirits, the white spirit, red spirit, black spirit, and green spirit, that is, those are symbols of Roman Catholicism, uh, communism, red, black capitalism, and green Islam. And all of these are going to be the great powers at the Sixth Trumpet War. And as I see it, and I'm going to show you in just a minute, the black horse is the odd man out because we can see that Russia and Iran are partners, Russia and Turkey are partners, Russia and Rome are partners, but the black horse of capitalism and Israel are the ones that are greatly opposed by this uh, coalition. 
I want to take you to the book of Revelation for just one second and show you that the Bible says in the last days there is going to be a world government rise up out of the seas of humanity, and it's going to have seven heads and ten horns. And we know that it, those seven heads are, for, the first head is the, is, it's got the mouth of a lion, which we know is Britain. It's going to have the feet of the bear, which is Russia. It's going to have the four heads of the uh, European Union, which was the first Reich of the Holy Roman Empire, the second Reich of the German Empire, the third Reich of Adolf Hitler, and the fourth Reich of the European Union. Those are the four heads of Europe. And then the seventh head is that dreadful uh, beast, that we know is the United Nations or the world government. All these are going to com be comprised in one huge world government. And the second verse of Revelation 13 said, The beast I saw was like a leopard. He had feet like a feet of a bear. His mouth was as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seed and his great authority. So that's talking about Satan. Is the, is the old serpent, the devil, is that dragon he's talking about. We also know those seven heads are Britain, Russia, the European Union, and the United Nations. And I want to show you how that this plays into this hostile war going on in Israel. Because if the feet of the bear are going to be in the world government, then we need to understand that Vladimir Putin is not going to take a whip, and he's going to be strong. What we're going to see Russia doing is going to play into this end time agenda. It's going to it's it's part of the end game, the biblical end game. Russia's going to be the feet of the world government. And we know that for many years now, Vladimir Putin has been the icon of Russia. And I, I take you to this article in a Russia Beyond uh, publication. They did a survey and said, what do average Russians think of Putin? And I want to read this to you to give you an idea of what we're dealing with in Russia. These days, the word mushik means a tough guy with a strong-willed character, the type of guy that, without saying a word, opens a beer bottle with their eyes and goes for a walk outside when it's 40 degrees below zero. A true music is the highest praise for a man, and this is what Putin embodies for many Russians. When asked what traits Vladimir Putin represents, many Russians use terms like courage and decisiveness and strength, self-confidence and bravery. Russia's annexation of Crimea was a very popular dis domestically issue, and following Putin's rating remained at 80% and above for a long time after the Crimean incident. It reached a historic high of 90% in 2015 when Russia began its military campaign in Syria. Now, guys, I want you to think about this. One of the most popular things Vladimir Putin has ever done in the eyes of the Russians was intervening in Syria. And that tells me that the next time he intervenes in Syria and the next time Russia moves down in the Middle East, he's going to have apparently the good support and full support of the Russians. So both of these events turned Putin into a true music in the eyes of many Russians. Having taken Crimea, he challenged the world community and acted contrary to Western opinion, explains Alex Levinson, the head of sociocultural research at Levada Center. He said, people have been feeling that the country is opposed to the whole world. It is this that in the eyes of the majority of Russians makes Russia a great power and Putin a strong leader who does not chicken out. Now guys, I'm talking about a biblical scenario when the end time world government, the prophesied world government is going to have the feet of a bear. Now let's look at this second feature and that's the mouth of the lion. He said he's going to have the mouth of the lion. Now I won't spend a lot of time on this. Anybody should know that the symbol of Britain is a lion and anybody should know that the great mouth of Britain today is King Charles III. So we see these seven heads. Look at Revelation 17, 12. He said, Then there were ten horns which he saw, and these ten horns which you saw are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. They have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Now, guys, I cannot tell you who these ten Horns are yet because it has not yet been revealed. The Bible tells us they'll be revealed in one hour when this beast comes into great power. We know from other prophecies that this beast is going to be in power for 42 months. So apparently at about the time of the mark of the beast and at about the time of the abomination of desolation, we're also going to see the ten horns of Europe materialize. And at that point, we should be able to accurately identify all the great ten horns of Europe. Then Daniel 7 tells us, however, there's going to be something happen 
in Europe that's going to change the complexion of this whole scenario when these ten horns are affected by a new horn rising up, a little horn that the Bible says is diverse from the first. Let's read this in Daniel 7, 24 and 25. The ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall arise after them. That's this little horn. And he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings, and he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. This little horn is going to oppose the church, and he's going to oppose Israel. And think to change times and laws. That sounds like a Muslim coming into a Catholic-ruled world. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of times. That's 42 months or three and a half years that this man of sin is going to be in power. This Muslim little horn. Let's go look at it again. Daniel 20 and 21. Of the ten horns that were in his head and of the other which came up before whom three fell. Even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows, I beheld until the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. He's going to make war with Israel and with Christians until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given unto the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. This is talking about Jesus Christ coming at the end of the 42 months. He's going to conquer the world. He's going to save Israel and his church when he comes. He's also called the king of the north. He's sp spoken of in Daniel chapter 11 as the king of the north. He uh, comes from Turkey. He's also identified in Ezekiel 38 as Gomer to Garma. The, he is an aggressor against Israel at the great and final battle of Armageddon. We know that he's going to have power for 42 months. He's going to be a world figure. The whole world is going to cooperate with him. He's going to commit the abomination of desolation. He's going to cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease in that holy temple. Revelation 11, 2 said of that new temple, but the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not for it's given to the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread underfoot 42 months. The Bible tells us that Jerusalem is going to be desolate for 42 months. Not only is he going to desolate the temple, he's going to desolate the entire city of Jerusalem. There are going to be many Jews who are going to die. Many people are going to die, and that's going to be at a time when a great war is going on between Judaism and Islam. We're going to see that temple is going to be hated above all things by the Muslims. It's going to be a point of greatest contention the world's ever seen. No doubt the biggest reason that will provoke this war will be the construction of that temple, and I certainly expect that temple to be built any day now. I don't know when it's going to happen, but it'll certainly be there by the time we reach the middle of that seven years. Here's an example. Turkey's Erdogan right now is calling on Israelis and Palestinians to act with restraint. And I have to tell you, he is going to be a voice. He's going to take command in this scenario. The Bible tells us that God is going to judge Israel because of its apostasy and certainly for rejecting Christ. And the Bible says there's going to be a man, he comes from Rome. There's two players in this situation. One is this uh, prince of Rome and the other is the Assyrian man of sin. Both of these guys are going to be involved in this last 42 months in a profound way. Of the prince of Rome, Daniel 9.27 says he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week which is seven years, and in the midst of the week, in the midst of the seven years, he will cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured out on the desolate. So for 42 months, the beast and the false prophet are going to render the temple and the city of Jerusalem desolate. It's going to be under siege, the Muslims are going to control it, and the Pope is going to be complicit with this. And in Matthew 24, Jesus said, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor shall ever be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. And more than that, there, Jesus warned in Luke 21, When you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then you know that desolation thereof is nigh. So this is the same time that the Assyrian man of sin goes into that temple and the Pope endorses this. 
the Bible said that's when Jer the Jerusalem is going to be surrounded. So it's not merely the holy temple under siege, but it's the whole city of Jerusalem and Israel at large. They shall fall by the edge of the sword, Jesus said, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. And I'll say largely Muslims and communists until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. It shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third part shall be left therein, and I'll bring the third part through the fire, and I will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried. And I didn't add the next verse here, but it starts talking about the battle of Armageddon in chapter 14, verse 1. So this is exactly before the battle of Armageddon. Two-thirds of Israel is going to die, and one-third are going to be tried in the fire like gold and silver. So I'm back to this four horsemen agenda. Once that, once that man of sin goes into the temple, once that... Uh, city of Jerusalem is surrounded by troops. Once the mark of the beast is launched, we know another thing that's in there is the seventh chapter of Revelation tells us that before the four spirits of the four horsemen will be loosed, 144,000 Jews have to be sealed, have to be sealed by the Holy Ghost, by the seal of God, and that's going to happen at the beginning of that 42 months too. So you got the mark of the beast, the abomination of desolation, Jerusalem surrounded by enemies, the 144,000 Jews sealed, and then we, then those four spirits are going to be loosed, and somewhere during that last 42 months, we're going to see that great four horsemen battle break loose on the Euphrates River, the Euphrates River War, which we know as the Sixth Trumpet War. And the black horse of that is probably going to be the weaker link in that, because the white horse of Catholicism will be joined with the red horse of communism and the green horse of Islam, and capitalism will be the target. Capitalism is likely to take a horrible defeat during this Sixth Trumpet War, and along with the capitalists in the United States, Israel is also a part of the black horse of capitalism, and we know that Israel is going to take a whipping during that time as well. The Six Trumpet War is going to take place. The White Horse, Red Horse, Black Horse, and Green Horse, unless you don't understand this, the White Horse is Catholicism. The Red Horse is Communism. The Black Horse is Capitalism. And the Green Horse is Islam. And they're going to go to war. Revelation 9, 14 tells us that the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, said, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loose, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month for a year to slay the third part of men. Now, this is not just a local war, because the word man here in the Greek language means mankind. So one-third of all human race is going to die in this war. It's going to be a horrific war during the great tribulation. That's why Jesus said, then shall be great tribulation, such was not, says the beginning of the world of this time, no, nor shall ever be. And uh, we, he said, except these days be curtailed or shortened, no flesh would be saved. But before, before Armageddon comes, we're going to see this six trumpet war. But I got to tell you, the six trumpet war and what we're seeing right now is bringing all these players together. The Battle of Armageddon has Russia, Gog and Magog. You see it here in verse 2 of Ezekiel 38. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya. That's in verse 5. That's Iran, Ethiopia, and Libya. So here are the aggressors. The aggressors at the Battle of Armageddon are Russia, Iran, Turkey, Ethiopia, and Libya. And the prophecy says in verse 7, to Russia, to Gog, be thou a guard unto them. So you're going to see Russia in cahoots, in collusion, in complicity with Iran, Turkey, Ethiopia, and Libya. That's what the prophecies tell us. And I'm telling you, everything you see between, between now and then is going to lead us to Armageddon. We're going to see Russia and Iran and Turkey and Ethiopia and Libya working closer and closer together as we get to the Four Horsemen War and finally the Battle of Armageddon. Here is the Armageddon Coalition. It includes the ten horns of Europe because the Bible said these horns will make war with the Lamb. We know Gomer and Tagarma is going to be there. That's Turkey. We know Magog and Magog, Meshach and Tubal are going to be there. The kings of the east are going to be there according to the sixth vial of the wrath of God. Persia is going to be there. That's Iran and Ethiopia and Libya. So these are all the people. That's for 42 months, Israel is going to be surrounded by all these hostile forces. And just bring this to your attention, Russia is urging right now Israel and Palestine to cease fire and return to negotiations. What you have to understand is Russia is trying to take the place 
of, of the United States and the West in leading this Mi Middle East scenario. Russia wants to control the Middle East, and you're going to see Russia and Vladimir Putin more and more vocal, and he's going to be working more and more with Recep Erdogan of Turkey. But meanwhile, President Netanyahu of Israel has promised a merciless war against Hamas and for their savagery, and he said Israel will avenge this black day for these thousands that have been killed and injured and taken hostages and treated so savagely. And he launched what was called the Operation Swords of Iron. Guys, I preached two videos before this war even broke out. I declared that the sword is coming. I said the sword is coming. August the 11th, I made a one hour long video trying to tell you the sword is coming. I made another video in September called The Cross, the Sword, and the Rod of Iron. And I talked about the sword is coming. And lo and behold, here in the month of October, we have seen the sword come. And it is a sword of iron from Israel. But I got to tell you, that's not the iron sword that the Bible tells is coming. It's going to be the iron sword of the mouth of Jesus Christ. And it's coming soon than you think. Ezekiel said, the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, when the land sins against me by trespassing grievously, I'm going to send the sword against the land and they shall deliver neither son or daughter. They shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. Go read those verses in Ezekiel chapter 14 verses 12 through 20. God said, if I bring that sword on the land and, they, and I say sword, go through the land so that I cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were with it. As I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters, but they shall only be delivered themselves. Every man's going to get saved on his own relationship with God. God brings a sword on the land. He said, sword, go through that land and cut off man and beast from it. This is the sword of the Lord. And Job said, be afraid of the sword of the Lord, for wrath brings the punishment of the sword that you may know there is a judgment. I'm telling you, judgment day is coming on Israel. Judgment day is coming on the whole world. The fear of the Lord, Proverbs 1, 7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Guys, Israel knows they're in trouble. That's why they're praying. 50,000 people went to the Wailing Wall this week, and they've been seeking the blessings of God. But I have to remind you that Jesus said, No man cometh to the Father but by me. The sins of Israel are going to be brought to justice. Daniel 9 says that for the purpose of making an end of their sins and transgressions, these prophecies are coming to pass. It's not just Israel under judgment. Rome is coming under judgment. Come hither, I'll show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. This war is going to spread to Rome before Jesus comes. Rome is going to be destroyed. The inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. John said in chapter 18, they, the men who saw the fall of Rome cried when they saw the smoke of her burning and said, what city is like unto this great city, speaking of Rome, for in one hour she's made desolate. God's also going to judge the Assyrian, this Muslim man of sin. He said, I'm going to break this Assyrian in my land and I'm on my mountains. I'm going to tread him underfoot. Then shall his yoke depart from off of them and his burden depart from off their shoulders. This is the purpose that's purposed on the whole earth and this is the hand that's stretched out on all the nations. And Micah, the prophet, said, This man, speaking of Jesus, the baby born in Bethlehem, shall be the peace when the Assyrians shall come into our land and when he shall tread in our palaces, they shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword the land of Nimrod in the entrances thereof. Thus shall he deliver us from the Assyrians when he comes into our land and when he treads within our borders. Jesus is going to deliver Israel from this Muslim man of sin. He's also going to judge false Christianity. The false prophets, the false teachers, the damnable heresies they've taught are going to come to judgment. The Bible said in Revelation 17, 16, the ten horns which you saw upon the beast, these are going to end up hating the whore. I suspect that when this Muslim little horn usurps three of those horns. Those whole ten horns are going to be turned against Rome. The Bible said they're going to make her desolate and eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put in the hearts of these ten horns to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God should be fulfilled. So Jesus Christ is going to destroy two men when he comes back. 
the beast, which is the voice of that seven-headed, ten-horned world government. You should know that right now the voice of that world government is probably King Charles. But before that little horn gets done, that voice is going to be the voice of that Assyrian man of sin. The false prophet is the lamb speaking like a dragon. That's the pope of the Roman Catholic Church. And this prophet said these both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. That's Jesus going to do that when he comes at the rapture, first resurrection, rapture of the church, both are going to be cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. Jesus is going to destroy the Assyrian when he returns, according to Isaiah 14, 25, and Micah 5. Jesus is going to destroy the little horn when he returns, according to Daniel 7 and 8. He's going to destroy the king of the north when he returns, according to Daniel 11, 45. He's going to destroy the man of sin when he returns, 2 Thessalonians 2 and 8. So all those verses tell us that this Muslim man of sin is going to get killed by Jesus. And then this last verse says the beast and the false prophet are going to be destroyed. So the false prophet's also going to be destroyed. That's the Muslim and the Catholic. Let me show you something. Do you realize how the Catholic Church and Islam is embracing one another right now? We've seen how the, the Pope is now embracing Islam. The Pope is embracing Islam full throttle. He is fostering a Chrislam theology that will ultimately collude with Islam against Israel. And yes, that's the Pope kissing Recep Erdogan. Can you believe it? Sputnik International says Turkey's Erdogan warns Israel against further denying statehood to Palestinians. And I got to tell you, the Israelis are not going to give that statehood. It's not going to happen. It's only going to come by war, and it's going to come with this man, Recep Erdogan, or someone following in his footsteps gets into that. And I, I have to say, if I'm wrong about Erdogan, it's going to be another man of his caliber, and it'll be somebody like the Pope. If Pope Francis dies, it'll be the next Pope, more than likely. But we're going to see Israel under assault from a Muslim and a Pope before it's over with. Look at this, what this news article says. Erdogan's strong stance. He's warning Israel amidst this crisis. He labels Israel a terrorist state. This man, Erdogan of Turkey, is calling Israel a terrorist state. Turkish President Recep Erdogan has sharply criticized Israel amidst escalating tensions in the region, going as far as calling it a terrorist state. This comes at a time when clashes and violence are surging in Jerusalem and Gaza painting a picture of increasing instability and strife. Erdogan's remarks are indicative of his support of Palestinians' cause and his stern stance against Israel's actions. He gives a warning to Israel. In a stern warning to Israel, Erdogan stated that if it continues to act as an organization rather than a state, it'll be treated as such. Now, you got to get this. Erdogan is warning. That he's going to treat them like a terrorist state. That sounds trouble. He accused Israel of being a terrorist state, expressing strong disapproval of their actions against the Palestinians. Erdogan's statements come at a crucial juncture when the international community is closely watching the unfolding events in this region. He's making accusation and he's calling for action, guys. Erdogan criticized Israel's decision to cut off water and electricity to Gaza. He's terming it a violation of international law. He's questioning the United States for sending troops and warships to the eastern Mediterranean to show support for the Israel after the recent attack by Hamas. And he warned that their involvement in the Gaza Strip could lead to massacres, indicating a potential escalation of the conflict. Erdogan's comments reflect his call to the international community to protect the rights of Palestinians and prevent further escalation of the conflict. I just have to tell you what the Bible says. God's going to judge the man of sin, and he's going to judge the false prophet and all their forces. Then shall that wicked be revealed, that lawless man, be revealed who the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and he will destroy with the brightness of his coming. John said in Revelation 19, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army and the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat on the horse, which sword proceeds out of his mouth. Guys, that's the mouth of Jesus Christ. Jesus is coming to judge the world for its sins. The Bible said in Acts 17, 31, he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. And in Hebrews 10, the scripture says, vengeance belong to me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. 
Matthew 3 said, whose fan is in his hand. This is John the Baptist speaking, speaking of Jesus. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat in his garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And then Paul said in 2 Thessalonians, the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. That's at the resurrection and rapture of the church in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. Folks, if you're a Christian, you're going to be resurrected. Those of you that's born again, you're going to be resurrected to see all this happening. You're going to be with the army of the Lord when he comes back at Armageddon. He's going to, in flaming fire, he's going to take vengeance on them that know not God and who obey not the gospel, who shall be punished with everything everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. Jesus said, and I learned this parable of the fig tree, when his branch is yet tender and puts forth leaves, and you know that summer is nigh. When you see all these things, know that it's near even at the doors. I'm telling you, all these prophetic signs are telling us we're in the last generation. He said, this generation will not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Then the question is, how long is a generation? Psalm 90 and 10 said, the days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow. For it's soon cut off and we fly away. So the parable of the fig tree is telling us that the last generation is 70 to 80 years. And this is Jesus' parable, by the way. He's telling us that when Israel was reborn in 1948, that triggered the last generation. Surely enough, 73 years later, we saw the Pope confirming a covenant with many for one week for seven years, Laudato C. And that fills us 80-year program. Guys, this is talking serious business. I'm just going to run through these, just take a quick second through these closing statements to help you to see the big picture. The last seven years of Daniel's prophecy will begin when the Pope confirms that covenant with many for seven years. And in the middle of that seven years, we'll see the mark of the beast mandated, and the man of sin is going to commit the abomination in the temple. The great tribulation will begin right then, and it will lead us 42 months later to the battle of Armageddon. The great tribulation will be 42 months of Satan soared against all mankind. The tribulation is Satan's wrath, not God's wrath. All mankind will suffer in the great tribulation. Israel will be punished for the apostasy and rejection of Christ. False Christianity are going to be punished for their deceptions and rejection of truth. Godless sinners are going to be punished for their rejection of the gospel. Evil kings and nations will be punished for their corruption and evils. And saints will be oppressed and afflicted by this world government beast during this epic spiritual warfare until Jesus comes to save us. At the second coming of Jesus, the first resurrection, rapture of the church, the sword of the Lord will destroy the sword of Satan. The Pope will confirm that covenant for seven years. I think that was Laudato C. We see the mouth of the lion, that's Britain's King Charles. We see the feet of the bear, that's Russia. We see the temple is about to be built, and we know that uh, probably the minute they open the doors is when the abomination is going to take place. We know the abomination is going to trigger the third temple, the, uh, the Assyrian man of sin, the little horn come down. We're going to see the Pope and the man of sin in great power as a world government for 42 months. We're going to see the mark of the beast revealed, that uh, chip, the cheesy stigma 666 means stick a prick. Uh, the mark of the beast means to stick a prick. Some Something's going to be put in our bodies. Nobody will be able to buy or sell without it in your right hand or your forehead. The mark of the beast, we know there's a global digital currency coming. There's a global ID coming, and it's coming sooner you can think. At the same time, the man of sin commits that abomination. Two preachers are going to rise up, two witnesses. They're going to preach the gospel for 42 months. And at that time, 144,000 Jews are going to get saved, and they'll be taken to a safe place during the great tribulation. The Assyrian man of sin is going to come to power and the four horsemen war is going to take place. And then the last thing to happen before Armageddon is going to be the seven vials of God's wrath. God's going to pour out his wrath. Number one vial is the sores on those who have the mark of the beast. So take note of this. The wrath of God is only poured out on people who have taken the mark of the beast. Number two and number three, the seas turn to blood and the rivers turn to blood. The fourth vial of God's wrath is that men are scorched by a solar event, some kind of a solar flare. The fifth vial is that darkness and torment are poured out on the seed of the beast uh, of the, the evil man of sin. The sixth 
uh, vial of God's wrath is that the Euphrates River is going to dry up and the kings of the east are going to come to Armageddon. And the very last thing before Armageddon is the destruction of Rome, which is Mystery Babylon. Rome's going to be destroyed immediately before Jesus arrives and the false prophet, Pope, and the Assyrian man of sin are going to meet Jesus Christ at his coming. Jesus said in Revelation 2, Repent! or else I will come to thee quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Revelation 19 said, Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he will smite the nations and shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. That's Jesus coming. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing asunder the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, the joints and marrow, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and tents of your heart. Guys, the word of God is going to win in the end. Don't, don't fail to believe the word of God. The last event is the seventh trumpet. That's the last trumpet. Paul said the dead in Christ are going to rise, and we which are alive and remain shall be called to meet him in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Israel is going to be fully restored. All the saints, Christian saints, are going to rule as kings and priests during the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ. And that points me to this great final conclusion. Get your heart right with God and get ready to meet Jesus. We're going to the great tribulation. It's not going to be easy. There's going to be great suffering, great tribulation for the whole world. There's only one security. You have to be born again. The old saying says, if you're only born once, you're going to die twice. That means you're going to die physically and you're going to die spiritually. That means you're going to go to hell. But if you're born again, if you're born the second time, you're only going to die once, and that's your physical death. Jesus told uh, Nicodemus in John chapter 3, Marvel not, I say unto you, you must be born again. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I'm telling you, you got to be born of the water. That's water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And born of the spirit like they did in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. Fill with the Holy Ghost. Speak with other tongues as the spirit of God gives you the utterance. Peter said to the people on the day of Pentecost, Repent, and this is what I say to you today. Be baptized, everyone listen to me, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. God promises it to you. It's to you, your children, and all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And Peter, with many other words, testified and exhorted, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. And I say to you today, Save yourself." from this untoward generation. Folks, I'm so glad that you stayed with me through this program today. I've had so much to say to you that I, I've just not even been on camera. I've just showed you all these facts. I hope you've learned something. I hope you realize, you know, I, I see so many atheists in the world today. They are so raging. They rage, rage and lift their voices against God. They mock God. They blaspheme God. They accuse God falsely of all kinds of things as if, there is no God to take vengeance on them, but I've lived through three years of atheism when I was a young man, and I can tell you something. I'll never go back to my atheism because I've found in him a true and living God. I've found the Bible is true. The testimony of Jesus is proven in the spirit of prophecy. I believe these all are coming to pass by the word of the Lord. No other prophets like the prophets of the Bible. I'm here to tell you, you need to hear what God's saying to you today. You need to hear the gospel plan. I want to tell you today, this is the only guarantee you have in trying times as ours. There's no promise any of us are going to survive the great tribulation. If we do, the Bible said, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet him in the air, and so shall we be with the Lord. So there will be survivors in the great tribulation. I, I encourage you to use prepping and to do whatever you can to get off the grid, but I know that that's not the answer to this situation. The big answer to your problem today is to get your heart right with God and keep it right with God. Get born again of the water and of the Spirit. Be born of the water and of the Spirit in Jesus' name and keep your heart right with God till Jesus comes. And that's my message to you tonight. I thank you for listening to me. I preach this every time I get a chance because I want all the people that I know to be saved. I'm reaching for you, friend. I don't know what brought you to this channel tonight. I don't know what brought you to this social network to see and hear what I'm saying. But I can tell you this, God wants to save you. Consider this a blessing of God that you've heard what you've heard tonight and consider it the call of God into your own salvation experience. In Jesus' name, 
be born again today. Find an apostolic Pentecostal church somewhere near you today. Go and ask that preacher to baptize in Jesus' name. Be, sh be sure that you've repented of all your sins, and that means turn your back on your sins and, and quit doing them and, and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins. It's in the waters of baptism that the blood of Jesus washes away your sins and then receive the Holy Ghost and be born of the Spirit of God. The Holy Ghost baptism is the Spirit of Jesus Christ. That's why Paul said, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. I say to you, you need the Spirit of Christ, which is the baptism of the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. Please come back and watch all of my videos. I'm on YouTube. I have a big YouTube channel here with over 400 videos. Please visit my channel. Subscribe to my channel while you're here so you get notifications of future videos. Also, follow me on Rumble and on BitChute. I have two backup video channels that you can watch. Also, go to my website at kenradio.com. Visit that website. Thousands and thousands of pages of Bible teachings from Genesis to Revelation. And uh, while you're there, sign up for my daily Bible studies by email email. There's a link under this video here in the description that you can click on to sign up for the Bible studies. Go to that link and put, put in your name and your email address and I'll send you Bible studies every day. Also go to amazon.com and take a look at all nine books that I've written. My daily Bible companion uh, is two volume set, Old Testament lessons in volume one, New Testament lessons in volume two. I teach lessons from every single chapter of the Bible and I think you'll, you'll find it to be a very pleasant experience. Every lesson is only 100 words. You can read many lessons a day and you can go through the entire Bible. I make it a companion because while you're reading your Bible, you can use this as a, a Bible study support system. Also, my book, The Daniel Prophecy, 726 pages. God's Plan for the Last Days, one of the most powerful prophecy books you're going to find anywhere in the world. Look it up on Amazon. Also, Great Doctrines of the Bible and a book called Praying on Purpose, Praying for Results, How Men Prevail with God. Also, a book called Treasures of Darkness, How to See the Glory of God in Your Darkest Trials. And if you can, uh, get all nine books. You can click on the link below and get all nine books for $125. And that's only for those that have a, a United States address. Please donate to this ministry. I need your support. I really do. Uh, I ask you to do what you can. If you can send a donation by snail mail, there's, a, there's an address below. Or you can, you can contribute by PayPal or Venmo and Cash App. And may God bless you for doing that. And I want to say how much I appreciate all those who, of you who are now supporting me and who have supported me in the past. And also, please help me to spread this message as far and wide as you can. Follow me on all my social networks, Facebook, MeWe, Gab, uh, Cloud Hub, uh, True Social, and all the others. Follow me there and share these videos where you can. Share all these posts and tell your friends about it. And I'll see you next time. Good night. God bless you. Thank you for watching. Please like and share and follow me on Facebook, Twitter, MeWe, Gab, Cloud Hub, BitChute, Rumble, YouTube, Telegram, True Social, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Visit my website at kenradjo.com for thousands of pages of Bible articles on every subject. Subscribe to receive my daily Bible studies by email. Go to Amazon, search for books by Ken Raggio. You'll see my daily Bible companion, 5,000 lessons almost from every chapter of the Bible, two volume set, Old and New Testaments. Get the Daniel prophecies, God's plan for the last days, 726 pages with footnotes, 175 photos, one of the most powerful prophecy teachings anywhere. Get the greatest doctrines of the Bible. Get praying on purpose, praying for results, how men prevail with God. Get long winding road, my very personal story and treasures of darkness how to see the glory of God in your darkest trials. Click the link below if you want all nine books for only $125 here in the United States only. And please donate through the link below and then share these videos with your friends and I'll see you next time. Good night.